Hello and welcome to the Gentleman Jack Effect. I'm Sarah from Calderdale Libraries and I'm joined by Angela Clare, Jill Liddington, the Reverend Jane Finn, David Glover, Helen Newburn and Laurie Hansen. Now we all work um, in Calderdale and we're all really passionate about sharing Anne Lister's story. Um, we've known about Anne Lister and done various events and exhibitions, tours, all sorts for the last few years. But in April 2019, the TV show Gentleman Jack aired, and it brought the, um, a much wider audience to Anne Lister because it aired on the BBC and on HBO in America. Um, so we had a fair inkling that the show was going to be popular. Um, this was kind of proved at the premiere, um, which was held at Square Chapel in Halifax, where we had 10,000 people apply for 200 tickets. Um, and really, the thing we possibly didn't account for is just how much Anne's story would resonate with an international audience and how passionate and dedicated some of the fans would be. And Calderdale and Halifax has really become um, a must-visit destination and a pilgrimage for fans. But it didn't just happen um, overnight and it didn't just happen by accident. So really we've been plotting and planning for a couple of years as soon as we found out that the show was going to air. And in, eight, and in July 2019, Laura coordinated the Anne Lister weekend, which was immensely popular. We got people from all around the world visiting Halifax. Many of them hadn't been to Halifax or Calderdale before. Uh, most of the events sold out. We had like 800 people through the door at Central Library and Archives where Anne Lister's diaries were on display on a single day. And the success has just kept going. So in August 2019, Shibben Hall got 14,000 people through the door, I think, whereas the previous August they got two and a half thousand. Um, so it just shows um, how popular the show is and how popular Anne Lister is. Um, so we've carried on working together collaboratively as a group of organisations, along with other people like West Yorkshire Archives, the Peace Hall and local businesses, to, as well as share Anne's story, also share why Calderdale and Halifax is so important to that story and just um, showcase what a really beautiful, heritage-rich place we're lucky enough to live in. Um, and one of the main things was we really, really wanted fans to just have an amazing time when they came to visit so that they'd tell their friends and come back and could make all these great connections that they've been making. Um, so I'm going to go over to the panellists very shortly and they're going to tell you a little bit about why Anlist is important to their organisation and what the Gentleman Jack effect has been. Um, we're live on YouTube and you can type your questions in the live chat and they'll be fed back to us and we'll answer as many as we can. So over to Angela. Well, thank you for having me. And yes, the Gentleman Jack effect has been massive, uh, especially at Shivton Hall. So I'm Calderdale Museum Service and um, which also looks after Shivton Hall. So it's been unprecedented. We knew it was gonna be big, but we didn't quite know how big. Um, it's really put Shivden on the map in a way that no matter what we did previously, we were never going to match an international TV series on BBC and HBO. So we're forever grateful for that and to get um, Amnesty's story out there in such a wonderful way. Um, it helps preserve Shivden Hall for the future, also gives us more funding to do building works and preserve the building and the park, improvements throughout the hall and park. Uh, we're still a small team though, uh, part of a service with uh, three other sites as well. So we are doing everything that we can at the moment and I'm just really loving um, this world stage that we now have. Um, we've been shouting about Anne Lister for quite a while though. I started back in 2015 and even back then, long before we met Sally, uh, we were doing Anne Lister conference for the first time, events on her birthday. Um, we installed a new AV machine to try and explore the diaries and show those pages working with Helena. In 2016, we did a Helena interview, and that has since been viewed 350,000 times now. So again, we couldn't have imagined when we did that back in 2016 that she would be so known throughout the world. Um, so we did a film about Shivan Hall as well. In 2017, that was when Sally mentioned that she might be doing a drama, and we discussed over tea and biscuits about doing a um, project to conserve the diaries and get some really good high-res scans to make them more accessible. And that happened in 2017 to 18. Uh, we did a book in 2018, Amnesty of Shipton Hall, to highlight the collections that we have and her legacy in the shape of the hall. 
and 2019 at Bankfield, we had the costumes from series one, which was a huge success, people visiting Shivden and coming across over to Bankfield to visit as well. And then we also had the filming and we are set for filming again, ready for season two as well. And next year, it's actually Shivden's 600 year anniversary. So we've got all kinds of things happening then, which we're really looking forward to. Um, hopefully, watch this space. Uh, so yeah, follow us on Shivden Hall um, across social media and our website. We've added a lot more content. We've done some online exhibitions, all Amnesty related, trying to share as much as we can. But obviously out there, there's a lot more specialists who are sharing some amazing research into Amnesty. So we're looking forward to learning more about Anne and hopefully sharing that in the future as well. So it's been a wonderful effect to see so many people coming and from such distances as well. And it's really been emotional. I think it's an emotional experience to discover this amazing woman and then be in her home and where she lived and literally walking in her footsteps. So it's been a wonderful journey to be part of that from when I started in 2015 to today. I never imagined how wonderful it would be. And it's been so great to be part of it. And it's lovely to be here today. And I can't wait to hear from the others about their Amnesty journeys. So I'm going to pass over to Jill. Right, well, thanks very much, Angela. Um, and uh, I'm very proud that Female Fortune, my book about Anne Lister in the 1830s, inspired Sally Wainwright to write Gentleman Jack. And that Gentleman Jack has now inspired so very many Anne Lister fans right round the globe, as we've heard. But even before this, before 2019, in 2011, so nine years ago, Anne Lister's magnificent diaries were inscribed in UNESCO's, UNESCO's UK Memory of the World Register. What an honour, a real honour, because it meant Anne Lister <coughs> was there alongside just two other UK diarists, Samuel Pepys and Eve, John Evelyn. So Anne Lister is up there with the very best. Hooray. Um, global recognition a Gentleman Jack and before it, UNESCO. <clears throat> and I don't think any of us could have predicted the tremendous impact J Gentleman Jack could have had last year. Its effect on me was the growth in demand for Anne Lister talks. I mean, these started, of course, in Halifax and elsewhere in Calderdale, London, Leeds, Manchester. <clears throat> and then last December, I was lucky enough to be invited on a book tour a small book tour in America <coughs> and to meet some of the US and Lister fans and their enthusiasm was unbounded. It was absolutely wonderful. Wow. But I don't really want to talk more about the BBC drama, but to ask the key question, who was the real Anne Lister? How do we get to know the real woman? Well, as you know, the Anne Lister diaries are between four and five million words long. And for me, for me to uncover the real Anne Lister, it's about reading the diaries as she wrote them, as she wrote them. We might just say that in the 1830s, much of the code concerns her relationship with wealthy Anne Walker, nearby heiress, who married uh, Anne Lister and came to live at Shibden in 1834. So we're reading from code to handwriting, to handwritten passages, back to code, as Anne Lister changes hour by hour, even mid-sentence. And then for me, as well as reading the diaries as Anne Lister wrote them, I think it's for me, it's interleaving the diaries with some of her other writing, of which her letters are particularly important. In the 1830s, of course, she's managing the Shifton estate with a lot of um, chutzpah, uh, she wants to be entrepreneurially active, economically active. So a lot of the letters are business letters. Yet some of them, and in a way, some of the most interesting of her writing are her letters to her titled women friends. And Anne would prefer to write to women friends who had titles rather than those who didn't. These were ladies like Lady Vera Cameron, Lady Stuart de Rossay, and elderly Lady Stuart. And these letters were very carefully phrased, very artful in their tone, even slightly flirtatious, uh, presenting at Anne Lister, she presents herself very carefully, adroitly, as a very elegant and sophisticated woman. 
And what we might note um, is that Anne Walker in these letters is quite often almost erased. She's, even though they're living um, a lesbian life together, uh, that's how Anne Lister sees it, as at Shibden, in the letters you see a very different picture. <coughs> well, bring it up to date, coronavirus has taken its toll. Of course it has. All our Anne Lister walks around Halifax and Shibden um, through Calderdale uh, heritage walks, planned for last April and Lister's birthday. They've all been cancelled, walks that David and I were involved in. And all our talks transferred from real spaces with real audiences in real rooms to Zoom. That has some advantages. We may not be able to see our audiences. We may not be able to hear their laughter or their gasps of <laughs> amazement of some of the things that Anne Lister does. But, and I think it's quite an important but, distances disappear. People don't have to each time get on a train or a plane or a motorway. They can just click onto their computer and see us digitally. So on Friday, for example, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and this the research summit, I hope you're going to join in. It's coordinated by um, Anne Lister fans in America, and it's reaching out to Anne Lister fans right across the globe, particularly to women and particularly to people in the LGBT community. So there we have it, the gentleman jacket effect. For Anne Lister herself, she suddenly gains last year and into this year a far wider readership and a far wider audience than we could ever imagine. And this has wonderful impact for Calderdale as well. And let me hand on to Jane to say something about that. Thanks ever so much, Jill. Uh, so, hi everybody. I'm Reverend Jane Finn. Um, I'm one of the priests at Halifax Minster. Um, it's where Anne Lister was baptised. We still use the font where she was baptised today for baptisms, not literally today because we can't at the moment. Um, it's where she attended church, where she took the sacraments and where she's now buried. It's where the Lister family vault is. The Minster's um, actually a Benedictine foundation and dates back um, quite a lot of years. Some parts of it are 900 years old. So we have this really rich history at the Minster and many significant people are either associated with the Minster um, or buried there. And Anne has always been a part of that heritage and part of the tours that we have at the Minster. But since Gentleman Jack aired on our screens and seen me change lots of people's lives, our visitor numbers, which had already gone up significantly with the Peace Hall, um, had then really, really rocketed in respect of the part that Anne has played in our history, the history of the Minster. So, of course, we've had large amounts of Gentleman Jack fans arriving to see the building. Um, which is a magnificent building. If you've never been, do come. And the place where she worshipped um, and where she was buried. The Minster was a really, really important place to Anne. She was um, a woman of really strong faith. And so the Minster was part of her regular life. So it's become a really important place to those who are now aware of her life and her legacy. And they want to um, come to the Minster and, and see all of those things. Along with our usual parish responsibilities that any church would have, we're part of the Church of England, we run a busy Minster church, which actually has a really wide remit. It's got civic responsibilities and involvement in a lot of collaboration across the town and the borough, um, which, you know, part of this group has been, which has been wonderful, and um, the private and the public and the voluntary sectors. And on top of all that, in case that wasn't enough to keep us busy, we operate as a tourist destination because of the significance and the history of the building. And of course, as I've said, we now regularly welcome visitors who are there because of Anne and her story. They come from locally across the country, but also from all over the world. And it's been absolutely wonderful and such a privilege to meet so many of her fans. An important aspect of being a priest at the Minster for me is about two things. It's about place and it's about presence. 
uh, the uniqueness of the place and its history and what I would call the ministry of presence, being present and available and welcoming for those who walk through the doors. And that's what we all try to be um, and to do. And two last things to finish with. Firstly, I've put together a special pilgrimage walk for Anne fans. It's called Anne Lister Way of the Sets. Um, you'll find it on the British Pilgrimage Trust website. There should be a link by the Minster website as well. And secondly, I'll be running a special memorial service tomorrow evening on the anniversary of Anne's death. It'll be at seven o'clock. Reservations are on Eventbrite because we can't go over numbers because of social distancing. So we do need reservations, um, but no cost, it's a service. If you can't make it um, or you're a long way away, then you should be able to access it live streamed. And I think there's going to be a link that will be mentioned later on in this session. Um, so that's all for now. And I'm going to hand over to David. Thank you, Jane. And thank you, Libraries, for inviting me to speak and participate here. My name's David Glover, and I'm the present president of Halifax Antiquarian Society, which is Halifax's oldest local history society. Founded in 1900, and it's, one of its founders was John Lister of Shipton Hall, uh, Anne's eventual successor there. My remit, perhaps, and I, I really went about this myself without particularly expecting to be able to use it in the way it's been possible to do, was to plot Anne Lister's life around the town of Halifax and its close environs, look at places she visited regularly, be they shops, businesses, or the houses of friends. Of course, there was also Rawson's Bank, which she visited regularly. Additionally, in conjunction with the Minster, Jane has already mentioned about the Ministry of Welcome at the Minster, and I'm thankful to be part of that ministry. I'm usually there twice a week welcoming people, and over this past weekend I've given some small presentations to groups about Anne Lister's life and interpretation of her life specifically in connection with the building where she was baptised, where she worshipped for many years, and where she lies buried. I had absolutely no idea last year when I was contacted by a lady from Massachusetts in the United States, sorry, a lady from New York in the United States, Pat Esgate, that when she contacted me and said, could I show her around various parts of Halifax and interpret them, interpret Halifax Minster in an Anne Lister connection, I had no idea how that would open the gates for more people getting in touch with me and asking for repeats. I prepared a number of lectures, some of which I have given, some of which have not yet been given because of COVID uh, problems uh, relating to Anne, uh, relating to Shibden Hall, relating to her father, relating to her family, and also relating to the youth of Anne Walker. So I had read up a tremendous lot about Anne Lister and Anne Walker probably over some 15 years and cumulatively that has come to be very valuable in interpretation. I've run a lot of group tours of Halifax Minster either for usually for small numbers but sometimes for larger numbers pointing out memorials and tombstones and such like which Anne Lister would have been able to interpret because she knew the people who were memorialized and parts of the Minster with which she was specifically familiar. So it's been an absolute joy to meet these people, mainly women from around the world, and I have never yet met one woman who's gone on a tour with me who I haven't liked, so I don't know whether that's because uh, all Anne Lister fans are delightful, or whether it's, I, I won't say anything at all about myself because that would be turning the wrong way. Anyway, I am very grateful for the opportunity to participate in the Anne Lister effect in Halifax. I've had a good relationship with the libraries over many years with our local arts centre, Square Chapel and other venues. But I'm only a person who stands on the shoulders of giants. And those giants in particular are Helena Whitbread, who did so much work initially on Anne Lister's diaries 
and Jill Liddington, who has worked likewise. However, that we should not forget the work of Patricia Hughes, who worked on Anne Lister's early diaries, nor the work of John Lister and his colleague in the 1880s and 1890s, who first published extracts from Anne's diaries in the Halifax Guardian newspaper, which is perhaps less known. Naturally, in those days, the confidential sections were not, uh, shall we say, shown to the world. In fact, we don't know for certain that John Lister had, in fact, devised how to unlock the code at that time. Anyway, thank you very much for having me, and I'm going to pass you on now to my friend Helen. Over to you. Thanks, David. Um, so, yeah, my name's Helen Newburn, uh, and I'm here representing Calderdale Pride. Um, so I look after a lot of the engagement and a lot of the social media activity, um, of which there is a lot around Gentleman Jack um, and a lot of engagement from people around the world um, wanting to connect with us because of the fact that we are obviously a very um, new Pride um, and an inclusive um, event. So we actually had an absence of around seven years um, having a Pride in Halifax. Um, and coincidentally, in 2018, we decided to attempt to bring that back to the local community. And we weren't really sure how much engagement we would get. Um, but it turned out that this television programme was being filmed uh, quite close by. And that aired a couple of months before we held Calderdale Pride last year. We saw very quickly that what would have been quite a modest Pride um, and very... Um, local and community based actually became we had visitors from not only Halifax and Calderdale but across the UK and also visitors from around Europe from America uh, we were having people from Canada contact us just wanting to to find out about the event and get some merchandise so we saw that effect very quickly um, and I don't think we could have timed it any better, to be honest. Um, the, there is no, no budget on that kind of promotion. Um, so yeah, we've, we've really seen some, some really generous um, offers and donations as well. We are a free event and we have created it for LGBTQ plus people um, to feel safe in this area and to create these safe spaces that are inclusive. So whether you live here, whether you visit here on a regular basis or whether it's a one-off um, visit, you will experience how inclusive Calderdale and Halifax is. And that's something that we've worked really hard with um, other organisations, a lot of the, the groups on this call. Calderdale Council and Visit Calderdale have really supported us with what we've tried to do. Um, and I think Gentleman Jack has been a massive part of that. Um, which has really, really shown our town um, off to the world, really. It's helped us in terms of trying to create this free event for people to come and visit us. Um, and we've seen a lot of national businesses wanting to get involved because they now know where Calderdale and Halifax is. And I think a few years ago, we used to have to describe Halifax as somewhere between Leeds and Manchester. And now everybody seems to know where Halifax is. Um, so, yeah, I don't think you can, you know, put into words really how it's helped us. As an organisation, um, you know, we are continually trying to get involved with more events. So we, you know, we want to support Jane with, with her services and, and help welcome people to the area. Um, and all the events that get put on, sometimes this is... It is, you know, the side of the desk. It's not always the full-time job and you have to put a lot of your own time in. And I would say having seen the efforts um, from the people on this call and behind the scenes as well, it's been such a, a collaborative thing. Um, and for us as a new pride to be involved in that has been really nice. Um, and yeah, and something that we hope to, to carry on um, in future years. So I hope that although Pride was cancelled this year, that we see lots of you next year. Um, I can't promise that we will get Saran Jones um, in person, but we will certainly do our best to, to bring an element of Gentleman Jack. So I'll hand over to Laura. 
Thanks, Helen. Hello, my name is Laura Johansson and I run the Cultural Destinations Cultural Tourism Project. And so I'm going to share with you my three top tips from a cultural tourism point of view. Um, and so my top tips are around seize the opportunity, be clear on your story and be collaborative, picking up on Helen's point. So first of all, take full advantage of an opportunity when you see it. So as you've heard, Gentleman Jack is an incredible piece of work that has reached an international audience. It's made by Calderdale local Sally Wainwright, who um, is from here, who knows this valley and has shown the Calder Valley to be a spectacular place in her previous work last time going Halifax uh, and Happy Valley. So we knew that this was going to be a project that meant a lot to her. She's worked on it for 20 years and we knew that it was going to be something that showed the Calder Valley to be a really special and incredible place. Um, so it was going to be a, a prime time international advert for us as a destination. So the task was with us to work out how we can do that best. And throughout, we've collaborated really closely with Sally Wainwright, with Anne Choma, who is also based locally, who's historical advisor on the show, Gentleman Jack, and with the production company in BBC to tell the story. Um, so then we had to work out what was our destination story. Why would you want to come here rather than anywhere else? What makes us different? And if, as some visitors are, you're traveling from LA, what else can you do when you're here? So we worked hard to work out different themes. So for example, heritage reimagined is something that we do really well here. You've heard about Shipton Hall and historic home and the 900 year old Minster. There's also the Peace Hall built in 1779, grade one listed, a building that I knew, but also one of the last surviving cloth halls, truly magnificent. And then not only that, but we also have Dean Clough, the world's largest carpet factory, now a commercial and creative hub. And that's just the, you know, scratching the surface. So that's heritage. Those are the things you can do. We also have an amazing literary story. We're really near the Bronte Parsonage. This is Ted Hughes country. We've got a really vibrant contemporary literary scene. And then just to pick up on Helen's point about the LGBT audience, this is a story that really means a lot to a lot of lesbians around the world. Uh, and we are lucky enough to have Hebden Bridge locally, which is a very picturesque uh, mill town, um, but also has been long known as the UK's lesbian capital. So there's a whole story, a long standing story of LGBT welcome in this valley that we could pick up on. And then finally, be collaborative. Now, not only is it lovely, so you can see all of us here today working together, bigging each other up, and that probably makes you want to visit. We sound like a friendly bunch, but actually there's a, um, there's a business case for it as well. So as you've heard, we've gone beyond the usual suspects. We've collaborated broadly with archives and with others who are less obvious. We've run outreach events for bars, hotels, uh, other accommodation providers, restaurants, volunteers who welcome visitors so that they know what the Anne Lister story is and the Gentleman Jack story. We've done the work for them as well. We've created a core script so that all of the information that they're sharing is as accurate as it can be and as up to date as it can be. We've created itineraries for visitors and we've also written content and created branding that has been for anyone to use. So if you're a really small B&B &B somewhere, you probably haven't got the time or the skills to do kind of detailed copywriting. So we just did the work for them. And so we found that this story spread far and wide. But I think the main thing that we've done is work with the fans because this is such an emotional story that is so meaningful to so many people. We really wanted to respect and honor that. And it also means that we can tell our story with more integrity and more authenticity. And, but what we've also found is that by including fans and making them really feel part of what we're trying to develop here, we also have created a global audience of people who love Halifax, who love the Calder Valley, who will come and visit and then return and sing our praises. And so that is also a really, really important part of what we're trying to do. So I'll finish there and I'll hand back now to Sarah for the Q&A session. Thank you all. So I've got a couple of little questions that I want to uh, that will just follow up on points and then we've got a few coming through so I'll um, start asking those as well. So um, the fans are so important. I really wanted to um, ask you about what reactions you've had from visiting fans, both people that are local because they're really important as well and also international fans and I think Angela and Jane both had some quite nice experiences that they wanted to share. So if we start with Angela. Yeah, so I think at Shifton Hall, it's just been fantastic, really. We've always had a lot of people who've discovered Anne throughout the last 20, 30 years who've visited and, 
it's been quite a journey for them. They felt, it, you know, they wanted to go to a home, they'd experienced Jill's or Helena's books, and then they've come to visit and see what it was all about and what Halifax is like. So we've had that for a while, but suddenly there's thousands of people doing that. So it's on a whole different scale now. And as I mentioned, it is emotional. And I think some people arrive and are just in tears because she means so much to them to see somebody so out and confident 200 years ago when it's still tough to be yourself today is remarkable and it's touched so many people and it's just a I feel really proud to work at Calderdale Museums and have been involved in that in a small way and I know that a lot of our staff and volunteers this job has just become even more rewarding than it was already um, so yeah it's been a privilege to see I'm sure Jane's got some examples as well. Um, yeah, it's been just really quite overwhelming. Um, when I went to work at the Minster a couple of years ago, I really wasn't expecting all of this to be part of my role there at all. Um, I don't think you could have called it, but it's been absolutely amazing. The volume of fans has been incredible. And um, I know you mentioned something, I think, about whether there was a difference between some of the younger visitors um, and other visitors. And it's something I hadn't really thought about before, but reflecting on it quickly after you've asked that question, um, I'd say that the younger visitors are um, impacted just as everyone else is. Um, that Anne's story and her life and her legacy has been massively important to all ages. But I'd say from my own experience, at least, that um, it's been more of an emotive experience for not for the younger generation. Um, I found that those that are coming in of the younger generation um, have maybe become more at peace with some of the issues and people of um, maybe a slightly older generation that have put up with years of stuff, frankly, that they shouldn't have had to, have been much more affected by Anne's story. And so when they walk into the Minster, and know that she's been in there and walked in there and that you know she's laid to rest there and um, it brings everything back and sometimes people will say they're absolutely fine and and they've come to terms with this that and the other in their life and how people may or may not have treated them well in the past um but then usually within minutes people are just in tears because there still is those deep places inside um that are starting to heal because of Anne's legacy and it's just such a powerful thing and it's been incredible to be part of real, real privilege. Thank you, that's lovely. Um, I've got a question for Laura. Um, again, following on from fans, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the Anne Lister birthday weekend, which was unfortunately cancelled due to COVID. But that was, so Calderdale was planning lots of stuff, but also there was this huge fan event um, planned. And I just wanted your thoughts about how you support uh, fan-led events without taking over and taking away their agency? Because obviously it's amazing if fans want to kind of come and organise stuff, but also we need to make sure that they have a great time here as like a group of organisations. Yeah, absolutely. So um, to go a step back, so we ran the Analyster weekend last year, last July, very light touch, just to test the water and see if there was any interest. As you've heard today, it went totally berserk. And among some of those people who came along and who were incredibly moved by the experience were, as David said, uh, to take one example, Pat Esgate, who um, came along to this, was very moved and felt that she had to kind of take some action around this. And so, as you say, we, you know, I, I feel like April the 3rd, Anne's birthday, and September the 22nd, the anniversary of her death, should now be permanent markers in the calendar for us to, to come together to reflect on her legacy and what that means. So as you say, we did have plans to run something in April, learning the lessons and listening to feedback about what people wanted. Um, but we did work closely with fans, partly because they, in many ways, can be more dynamic and nimble. Um, than perhaps organisations trying to pull lots of different people together can. I think that the authenticity of a fan who has come to Analyst have found that through her, his or her own personal journey has an integrity that those of us doing it professionally um, do our best to have, but it's a different kind of story. Um, and I think, you know, you don't want to 
harness people's enthusiasm. They were desperate to do something and they wanted to be part of it. You know, well, why not encourage that and try and facilitate it in some way? So um, really what I think we did was just really try and stay in close touch and really keep communication channels open about what it is and what isn't going to work and the story that we want to tell just so that we can and just transparency really about so that we can all try and make sure we're heading in the same direction that we're telling the story in an appropriate way but also that visitors and customers are finding it easy to get information and decide what they want to do when and so there's a really clear vision across the piece i think that's probably the the best advice keep oh, keep talking thank you um, I think we'll move on to a couple of questions that have come through. So the first one's for Angela. It's um, when we visit Shipton Hall now, how close to, is what we see to what um, Anne's home would look like when she lived there? Um, well, I think probably the answer is by the guidebook. <laughs> that tells you a lot more about room by room what you're looking at. Um, overall, a lot of what I always talk about is what the impact Anne had on Shipton and the fact that you can see you know, even through, they've got the building, all the landscape, the gatehouse, the lake, all of that is Anne. She's everywhere at Shibden. Furniture-wise, obviously, we don't always know the provenance of things, so we've made things look what we think they might have been, but you're trying to showcase 600 years of history <laughs> in quite a small hall, so it's not always sort of easy to do. But yeah, by the guide, but we've recently done a new 3D virtual tour of Shibden Hall, which goes live in a few weeks. And that will be amazing, especially for people who haven't been able to visit or want to go again and spend more time looking around. That's going to be released very soon. And that's got lots of hotspots. You can click on all kinds of different things and find out more. So that should hopefully give you more insights into Amnesty's Shipping Hall. Um, so the next question is for Jill. And that's, how have the reactions from audiences in the UK and the US been different? when you give your talks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say they're very different in essence because so many of the audience members are from the LGBT community, are gay women and their response to the Andista story and, and what the story that the diaries tell are very, very similar. Um, I suppose that you might say that there's a slightly more emotional discovery for women um, in the United States because they're less likely to have grown up with or have heard of Anne Vista. For example, there was a, a BBC Two drama with Maxine Peake in 2010, which some of us can still remember. Um, and people have been coming to Shipton for since it uh, opened uh, for, in, you know, past from the Listers to Halifax Borough as it was in the 1930s. So there's more familiarity. Um, I suppose what I always do with uh, talking to an American audiences is, is <laughs> what I did in December in those innocent days of 2019 is try and encourage them to come to Halifax because I think it's very difficult to try and understand and Lister, just from Gentleman Jack or just from what you're reading, if you don't actually come to Halifax and see Shibden and see the Peace Hall and see the Minster and see Old Bank, that I think all of us on screen have actually walked up Old Bank at one time or another, up and down it. And that's a route that Anne Lister did uh, two or three times a week, uh, certainly in the 1830s when she was remodeling Shibden. So I have encouraged them to come. And one of the things I'd very much like to do, if and when the coronavirus lockdown is over, is reintroduce our um, Anlister walks, Shibden and Halifax, through Calderdale Heritage Walks. Because I think the, the, the privilege of being able to walk in Anlister's footsteps and to walk up, for example, Pump Lane above Shibden Hall, and again, it's quite steep, up to the top of uh, Shibden uh, Estate and look at the kind of uh, landscape that she looked at. And I think I'd suggest that the landscape is slightly less changed than, than some aspects of um, Shibden Hall itself. So it really is wonderful to be able to walk in the countryside that she walked in. Uh, a long and rambling answer to a very pointed question. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, I'm just going to go over to Laura because I'm aware she might have to do a runner fairly soon. So I just wanted to ask about some of the partners that you've particularly worked with aren't obvious choices. So like artists and makers and also local businesses. And I'm wondering in terms of getting them in, on board and enthusiastic about um, how, like what's really worked for you? In terms of engaging. Thanks and let me just start by explaining I'll, I'll need to dash off to prepare something for tomorrow for the live stream that will be at three o'clock um, and it's going to be a broadcast much of it pre-recorded unfortunately because of the situation but from Shipton Hall um, so it's not that I don't care. Um, so yeah I think partly as you can tell by now I love this story I used to work in Shipton Hall as a teenager in the cafe so it's one that I've been engaged with for a long time so this is like for many others this is something with whose moment has finally come and it's an absolute joy and pleasure to be part of the team spreading the word so I think it's partly about you know people love a bit of film and screen razzle dazzle so if it's something to do with telly and there's a lot of affection for Sally Wainwright locally people are already very well disposed to whatever you're trying to do. And then obviously once you've got Saran Jones in the mix, I mean, you know, everyone wants a part of it. But I think um, what we did was we, so we ran outreach events, as you say, with local businesses, just to explain what the impact can be, but also how to get the benefit from it. And it might not be immediately obvious. So it's about kind of making sure that you've got that unlisted gentleman Jack related content on your website so that Google searches can pick it up when people are researching their trip. It's about, for example, including that information in your newsletters, which Hold With House, Shift and Millen have done very well. It's about targeting that audience uh, specifically. Um, and so there are lots of different things that you can do and it makes business sense to get on board with it as well as, you know, just be a, a fun thing to do. Um, and as you say, lots of artists, um, you know, because Anne is such a rich character, there are so many different things. So you've just done a great video about her love of books. Um, her love of travel is incredibly powerful. Her scholarship, her the fact she was a linguist, you know, all of these things, of a mountaineer, such rich pickings for an artist to want to interpret. And we've got some really great um, queer art practitioners as well locally who kind of, for whom it really strikes a chord. And so we've worked also with Anna Jacks, who's got a big queer street art project and we'd hope to have her up creating art, but obviously that wasn't possible. So I think it's about both have creating an emotional response, but also pointing out how it makes business sense to all these places to get on board as well. Thank you. Um, I think that takes us quite neatly into a question I had about Helen, which was about so Calderdale's got this really amazing um, pool of LGBTQ talent, especially like poetry and performance and that kind of thing. So I wondered how have you been able to take advantage of the Gentleman Jack effect to help them um, yeah, get an audience, I guess, really? Or is that something you're thinking about in the future? Yeah, we've definitely tried to do that. Um, so last year we held um, a bit of a talent competition so that you know, local people from the community could actually perform on the day. And we ended up agreeing, we should have had one winner, but there were so many good, um, so many good people that we ended up having about four or five different performers. But yeah, we've got a lot of younger people who are starting to become really comfortable with their identity, uh, whether it's their gender identity or whether it's their sexuality um, because of Gentleman Jack. So I think being in Halifax has helped a lot of young people start to express themselves a little bit more. And, you know, for some of the people that, that wanted to perform, you know, they were as young as kind of 14, 15, and they were really putting themselves out there. Um, but yeah, there was so much talent that we kind of couldn't decide. Um, and a lot of those people have, have gone on to to keep going with it you know we, sometimes we see um you know one of the artists we had uh, performs at the peace hall quite a lot or you see them busking in town or they go and read some of their poetry at the the queer poetry nights at the village lgbt bar so yeah we've right we've really tried to involve them and kind of help them on their way really and, and we did plan to do the same this year um, but yeah we'll definitely be carrying that over because we we want to showcase what Halifax and Calderdale has to offer. Great, thank you. 
So I've got a two part question for for Jane, and it's um, what's the reaction been from other par from parishioners at the parish church, and also what can people do to support the minister until they can visit in person more often? Um, so parishioners, um, it's interesting because we're not just like a because we're not a usual parish church. Um, there's not so much ownership that you can get in smaller churches um, in terms of being insular. So everybody's very outward focused anyway um, and very on board with the fact that the Minster exists as a tourist destination as well as a place of worship. So they're sort of really well versed with um, anything really and anyone who comes in and anybody that they want to visit and they always know who to signpost people to if people talk to them and want to know something about the history of the building or any of the people associated with the building or any of the Anne Lister um, side of things. They'll always know who to sort of point people to. So on the whole, I think also because we're um, a fully inclusive um, church at the Minster, um, everybody's really embraced it all, um, but also take it in their stride that that's also part of what the Minster's about, that it's something other than just them and their worshipping community. Um, so it's it's been really, really positive, actually. I've had nothing negative certainly filter through to me, and it's not long usually before you, you hear of murmurings, if there are murmurings around in churches. Um, and what was the second part of the question? Remind me. And people have asked what they can do to support the Minster until they can visit. Oh, OK. Um, I'm assuming you're, you're talking about people that are further away that can't actually get to Halifax at the moment. Um, I think really just to sort of um, keep it out there in people's consciousness, um, the story of the Minster. Um, if they go onto the Minster website, they can keep up to date with anything that is going on, anything we are running. We've been running services for a couple of months now. Um, and... Um, yeah, that, that everything would be on the Minster website in terms of any way that it can be supported. There's always a need for more volunteers. So anybody, we try to have people welcoming at the Minster. Um, usually we used to do it from about 10 till 4 every day, seven days a week. But currently with um, COVID, a lot of our welcomers aren't able to currently come out. So we've had to reduce our welcoming hours. So if anybody was interested in maybe thinking about helping to learn how to welcome visitors and know a bit more about the building and, and do a two hour shift here and there, then that'd be great as well. They could maybe get in touch. Thank you. Um, so the next question is possibly for a few of you. It says, um, it'd be great if it was a little bit easier to find some of the most important local places and sites described in the diaries have you thought of creating an Anne Lister historical trail? Now, I think David, Jill and possibly Jane have all done little bits of work around this with heritage talks and stuff. So should we start with David? Because he's not said anything for a bit. I'm quite happy keeping quiet. I know my place, I do. Anyway, <laughs> you're absolutely right. There is a vital need, and I have been trying to press this for about a year now, that we should have more information out there for the public, both in hard copy locally when people visit Halifax and also in preparation or if they want to read about locations. I am happy to work with either the local council, the local libraries, whoever, to put something of this nature together, be it a plan, be it a, some sort of a, a guide with a map. Uh, I, I would imagine others would feel the same. I've done quite a lot of work, as I've said, in Anne's links and her involvement with the parish church, the, now the Minster. That I, that's a sort of responsibility that I have taken on board, but I'm not a, a member of the clergy. That's Jane's, Jane's particular remit. There is scope at the Minster for much more signposting regarding Anne. There's no doubt about that too. 
I just go along with what David's said. I mean, I think it's it's so important that people can walk around Halifax and recognise some of the familiar landmarks. Um, she's quite an inveterate shopper, um, and particularly the bookshop, but also the drapers, et cetera, et cetera, uh, not too far from the current town, town hall. Um, we're very much hoping that when coronavirus is over, that um, Calderdale Heritage Walks can start again because there's nothing like having a guided walk led by somebody who really knows uh, the landscape and the geography and the townscape and can infuse you and inform you um, to take you around Halifax or take you up Old Bank and around Shipton Estate. And just suppose the coronavirus lockdown goes on for another few months. Um, one of the books I'd recommend is um, Alan Betteridge and uh, Bridge, Betteridge and Bridge, Maps and Plans of Old Halifax. Those copies, uh, probably I hope multiple copies in uh, Calderdale Library. And it is a fantastic big volume. You just open it up and there is James Zay's plan of Halifax, 1835. You can see the Minster, you can see Halifax Peace Hall, you can see Hope Hall. Uh, where Anne Lister's coal rival, uh, Christopher Olson, banker, lived. You can see where some of the uh, people who appear in her diaries lived, um, plus some descriptions and these wonderful drawings of uh, Halifax. And there are also drawings available of Shibden. And uh, please make a beeline to the library because it's now open, isn't it, Sarah? Well, a bit. <laughs> a bit. It's open for book, uh, for collecting books at the moment and returns. The local study section isn't open yet. We're in phase two, which we're really hoping isn't going to be too long, but we're just Great. waiting. Great. Laura, did you want to? Yeah, just to chip in on that, um, I completely agree with the question that this is something that we really need. And it's something that um, I've had on my to-do list for about a year and a half. But I think it's just worth mentioning at this point, that obviously, everybody will come across this challenge that it's one of resources. Um, obviously, working on Unlisted, though it's a personal passion for many of us, it is often a very small percentage of a very busy day job. So although we do have these aspirations, um, and I had, in fact, again, just before COVID, written a big funding bid to try and be able to get some decent resource behind this. Unfortunately, that is, is on pause a little bit. But what I would say is that on if you go to visit Calderdale, there are lots of different blogs on there that will, you know, if you are interested, for example, in heritage or working in her, walking in her footsteps or in the filming locations, there's lots of content on there that you can pick up thematically. So do have a look at the Visit Caldsdale pages to get a bit more information. Can I just add to that? Because in a way, um, there's nothing, you know, that quite matches reading the Anne Lister diaries. Um, <clears throat> they are, you know, UNESCO <laughs> recognised them nine years ago and they are unique. They're up there with Samuel Pepys's diary. And what the diaries do, and the, the original diary is very fragile, are in the archives in Halifax Library, but there are about a dozen books now with extracts or uh, editions of the different periods of, of the Anne Lister's diary. And what they do is they take you into her world, which is not our world. It is absolutely not our world. It has been suggested that Anne Lister was the first modern lesbian. Really? <laughs> I don't think so. I think what she did do was the first modern, first known account, uh, first person account in candid, vivid detail of living a lesbian life in the early 19th century. And as soon as we read the Anne Lister diaries and get into her world, particularly her social world, which was the world of the landed gentry of West Riding, Halifax West Riding, uh, lesser landed gentry, and see the kind of so how social class worked, we begin to understand a little bit more about how she was able to do what she did, how she was able to lead a lesbian life very discreetly when she came down into Halifax, uh, when she came shopping or if she went to the Minster or if she went to the bank, which she did regularly, or to see her lawyer by the Peace Hall, she knew all these people, professionals, tradesmen, shopkeepers, depended on the custom of Miss Lister at uh, Shibden Hall. And she also knew that Shibden Hall, as we know, is just tucked outside the prying eyes down in the town of Halifax. So she was able to do things that people are rather surprised about now. Um, 
live a, a lesbian life in the 1830s. And what I've argued is that became rather more difficult later on in the 19th century. Um, David's referred to John Lister in around 1892, putting the diaries back behind the secret panels at Shibden once he and Arthur Barrell had cracked the code because the legislation against male homosexuality got tougher and harder and more punitive in the late 19th century. And there was this culture of silence around, around lesbianism. And oddly, and I'll end on this note, uh, the legislation then didn't affect women, it didn't criminalize lesbian activity, and that didn't happen, uh, didn't, le legislation didn't affect women until 1988. And the Local Government uh, Act under Mrs. Thatcher's government, which uh, forbade the encouragement of homosexual uh, of homosexuality in local authority um, premises and services. That was mainly, of course, directed at teachers and the classroom and the school syllabus, but it also affected uh, what Calderdale could do in terms of its museum service. Um, and what Shibden can put up on its display boards. And luckily that piece of legislation, um, prohibitive legislation, only lasted only for 15 years. And when we come to uh, 2003, it was uh, stopped, it was repealed. And we can now live in a more open life where a local authority can say much more, have much more freedom to say what it wants about Anne Lister and the kind of life she lived, living a lesbian life in the 1830s. Thank you. So our next question is a general one, and it's what are your plans for continuing to share and celebrate Anne's story and diaries? So maybe it'd be good to talk to Angela because I know Shibden have got lots of things planned, I think. Yeah, well, obviously, we did have a lot planned for this year, um, <laughs> including Laura's massive and this diversity weekend, which would have been amazing. But I think what was online was still very good and everybody made the most of it. So, yeah, we would have had a busy year. We are open again and it's reasonably busy, but obviously we have to limit numbers and do things very carefully. But people that have been visiting have felt very happy with how we've set things up. So, yeah, it, well, this year was actually the start of Shivden's 600 year anniversary. It was first recorded in 1420-21, which luckily means we can shoot all of that <laughs> into 2021. So next year is going to be big for celebrations of Anne Lister, of course. Uh, we'll hopefully have Series 2 coming out, either later next year or early 2022. Um, we'll hopefully have more costumes to display. We've been offered, uh, hopefully, Series 2 costumes as well. So we'll have an even bigger exhibition of all that at Bankfield. And for Shipping 600, we're awaiting to see what we're allowed to do, because um, you could invest a lot of time and energy and not actually be able to run some events. So we're being quite clever in looking at how we can do things online and in person and try and reach as many people as possible. So yeah, we've got a lot in the pipeline to celebrate 600 years of Shipton and obviously Anne's very key role within that. Um, so watch this space. I think if everybody can look at our website, look at our social media at Shifton Hall, we will let everybody know as soon as we know what we can do next year. But yeah, we've got some exciting plans if we can do them. Thank you. Does anyone else want to comment on that, about things they've got coming up to continue celebrating Anne Lister? No. Oh, yeah. Um, Jane and then David. Now, just quickly say, don't forget to tune in tomorrow to the live broadcast, which I'm just going to go and uh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Bye. Um, yeah, personally, um, I'm currently researching Anne's theology as part of a master's that I'm doing. Um, so that's going to be really interesting to see that develop and unfold um, and hopefully getting input from various people on that. We're available um, and open, as I say, seven days a week. At the moment, it's 12 till 4, so people can still come in and see where she was baptised and see where her gravestone is. 
we will eventually again it'll be a bit watch this space and social media oh, not social media the minster media um for information about the process that we've been going through as most people know in terms of locating the family vault and ruling out various possibilities that information is not quite available yet um, but that will be coming up so um, you can watch out for more information about that as for angela there'll be plans as always for um, the birthday and the memorial celebrations um, hopefully a sacramental service in the future i mean there's uh, eucharistic services six days a week anyway but it would have been nice to have been able to do a special eucharistic service for um in connection with Anne, but uh, that's had to go on hold as well because of the current restrictions so maybe something for for next year but people are always welcome to come to any other service and the eucharists that we run anyway um and, I, and all the things that that will be available in the shop for people to buy if they come and visit and and have a look around um, and again, as for Angela, just keep your eye on the Minster website to see what else might be cropping up. David? Yes, I mean, I, I thoroughly endorse what Jane says. I mean, people need to be aware. They don't even have to be Christian to attend a service at the Minster. They can come and sit quietly and listen to a service without participating. They might be encouraged to participate, who knows? I do think that looking forward though, generally, the self-generation of the series, as it seems as though there might be two or three series of Gentleman Jack, will constantly be driving forward the knowledge of our Mister around the world and can only resound in favour of Halifax and Shibden and this area. So we do need to get the offer right here in the area where she is. There's a need to have the right um, books, the right leaflets, the right information, probably more pointers in the direction in town connected with Anne Lister. I think that's really all I can say, but I do think that we have a great opportunity, which is getting greater with the possibility of perhaps two more series of Gentleman Jack, and we must not get it wrong what we're doing locally. Just to add to that, I absolutely agree, of course. Uh, one of the great pleasures over the, this year has been meeting some of the new groups, or new to me, um, I've only lived in Calderdale 40 years, but I'd never come across Happy Valley Pride, which is mainly uh, based down in Hebden Bridge. And I met them. It's mainly a group of uh, gay men, incredibly nice gay men. And we did a, uh, uh, it was going to be a meeting in Hebden Bridge Town Hall that was cancelled at the very last minute. It was going to be early April, had to be cancelled, but we put it out on Zoom. And I think Anne Lister just touches so many different people and different groups. And it's, it is just wonderful to be able to meet them and work with them. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, my next question is actually for Jill as well. Um, it says, do you see future research of Anne's diaries or do you feel the work is largely done? I don't think the work is largely done, no. I think some of the work is done um, and there's one person I've just mentioned very br briefly who's done some useful work though possibly controversial work and that's somebody called Angela Steedle who's German, comes from Germany and her biography of uh, Anne Lister which came out a couple of years ago, published in Berlin, was then translated into English and published in uh, London publisher, Serpent's Tale. And uh, that has the advantage of uh, covering the whole of Anne Lister's life and, and the diaries from the date of her, moment of her birth to the moment of her death in West Georgia in 1840 and being very well referenced. Um, which is very helpful because we, often with Anne Lister, you've got your thumb somewhere in the, the references at the back because you want to know how do they know that. Um, where it's been controversial or come in for some critical comment is that it's rather 
or indeed its critics would say wholly dependent on secondary sources, um, which is largely Helena Whitbread's research for the earlier Anne Lister, uh, my research on the 1830s, and Phyllis Ramsden, who we really should have mentioned, um, who did so much work on, on the coded sections of the diary after the Second World War into, up into the 1980s and on Anne Lister's travels. So it's a very useful read and it compresses Anne Lister within um, two covers like, but like that. But you do need to read it with perhaps a rather critical, critical eye as to, uh, and it hopefully will whet your appetite to go back to people who've actually read the diaries. Um, does anyone else want to come in on that? I've got some a couple of things to plug about that. So I think we need to, we've not really mentioned the Anlister code breakers who are doing amazing work um, transcribing the diaries at the moment. And if you go on the West Yorkshire Archive site, they've actually just released a load of transcriptions. So I think that's going to, um, yeah, make researching Anne Lister's diaries like a lot more accessible to people. Because if you're like me and haven't got the patience to like spend hours um, deciphering a handwriting, you might all, you might still have, yeah, political or like class perspective or you know different perspectives when reading a diaries that you might not have been able to have before. Another thing is the Anne Lister Research Summit. And um, there's loads of really exciting looking panels sort of going on. Um, and that starts this weekend, from so Friday. Friday, yeah. So I think there's just so much research ongoing, isn't there, with different people getting involved. It's quite exciting at the moment. Yes, and the thing about the Anne Lister Diaries, which started when she was just a schoolgirl in 1806, she was 15. It starts as a little schoolgirl, you know, one line per day. Um, it does grow as Anne Lister grows in, uh, in, in taking herself seriously. And once Uncle James dies in 1826 and she inherits Shibden Hall, then in the 1830s when she returns to Shibden and uh, forms the union with Anne Walker, the, the diaries get longer and longer and longer and more and more detailed. So it's worth being aware of that before anybody plunges in. And by the very end, uh, 1839, th 1840, they really are incredibly detailed, <laughs> but very rewarding if you've got the time. Brilliant. Um, so just had one more question come through on YouTube and um, yeah, I think Angela spotted it and she sent a link to the museum's page, but basically somebody wants to know where they can they buy lots of Anne Lister related merchandise. Um, it'd be great if it was in one place, which it isn't at the moment, but maybe you can all um, say what sort of merch people can buy from your organisation. Um, so yes, obviously Shipton Hall, uh, we've been shut for a while, and so we've lost a lot of income this year, like a lot of places, and we would have had a lot more going on. Um, but yeah, we have got our guidebooks and our Amnesty of Shipton Hall book uh, available on our website. They've been available in our shop for a long time now. And lots of other stuff as well, various Anderson merch that we have, and a lot of Shipton Hall things as well. So, and everything that you buy from us direct goes directly into supporting Shipton Hall and paying for us to look after the site and collections in the future. Uh, there's also some donate buttons on there as well, if anybody is able to support us. Um, but yeah, I'm sure other people have mentioned their things that they've got as well. I'll just mention my favourite bookshop in Calderdale, which is the one in, in Halifax Peace Hall, <laughs> which is the Book Corner, which is uh, one of the best places to go to uh, for a, a, a full range of the Anne Lister titles. And it's a fantastic bookshop. And it's in the one corner of the Halifax Peace Hall. So you, it ticks all boxes. Thank you. Um... Unless anybody has anything else they want to add about the Gentleman Jack effect, um, then we might start wrapping up. Everyone happy? Okay. I'll just say it might be nice to do this again, Gentleman Jack effect review in another year's time, when hopefully we'll be back up and running and we'll be seeing what the next birthday is going to be like and everything else. So hopefully um, we'll all be back up and running and be able to celebrate in person a lot more next year. So fingers crossed. And yeah, I think let's do this again, Sarah, next year. Definitely. And one quick word from me. One of the things I'm taking away from this session is people 
10 years ago, 20 years ago, saying Halifax, where's that? Oh, it's somewhere between Manchester and Leeds. And now people are thinking, I know exactly where Halifax is, and maybe Leeds and Manchester are either side of it. Ma uh, Halifax has become a really important town, thanks to Anne Lister and Gentleman Jack. Come here, come and visit, please. Um, yeah, I think I'd just... Go on, Helen, and then David. I think I'd just add that as someone, you know, who was born in Halifax and, you know, has, has works here and still lives here, that put in, you know, all the visitors and, and people, I would really like people to put back in to the organisations within Halifax and Coldsdale, as we've been talking about merchandise and that type of thing, it is all put back into the community and it is all put back into our heritage sites and it is used to obviously, pro, you know, prolong um, all the events that, that want to be carried out. I will completely admit that prior to Gentleman Jack, um, I was, I, I knew very little about Anne Lister and that is obviously someone who was born here and, and lives here. Um, and I think it's, yeah, at the moment, I think it's all about sharing all these events that are going on and that people are putting so much time and effort into trying to spread the word within our local community as well, because there's so much going on and there's, there's such a lot to learn about that I, you know, shamefully, it took me till I was 34 to start learning about, um, but it's such an important part of our town and um, that, yeah, I would just encourage people to really visit Halifax and kind of put back into the local community that's working really hard um, to, to create such events that, that do take a long time to put on. So, uh, yeah. David and then Jane. What I would like to say, and please, I'm not trying to be patronising in saying this, but Halifax and the world owe an enormous amount to Sally Wainwright. If we track that back, we owe an enormous amount to Jill Liddington. If we track back, we owe an enormous amount to Helena Whitbread. But going back a little bit further, we shouldn't forget, as Jill has indicated, that a lady named Phyllis Ramsden did a lot of work uh, in the 1950s and 60s, I think it was, on Anne's diaries and made lots of transcripts along with Vivian Ingham, Dr. Vivian Ingham. We should not forget, though, going further back, that we would not have the diaries today had it not been for the determination of John Lister of Shibden Hall not to burn them on the advice of his close friend who helped decipher the code back in the 1890s. Exactly. Jane? Yeah, I just wanted to say, like, coming to Halifax a couple of years ago, um, I've been absolutely bowled over by the sense of the community here um, and the collaboration that we've all had over um, all of the Anne Lister events last year and the ones that were planned for this year um, and hopefully next year has been absolutely amazing. And the friendship that we've all had and the community that I think we've all felt has been almost like a little um, bubble of the same sort of community feel that a lot of people across the world have felt in the connection that Anne's brought everybody. Um, the size of the town maybe helps because it's not a city, but it, it's bigger than a town. So there's lots of different sectors to get involved with. But I have just been bowled over by that sense of community and how welcoming everybody's been and how much I feel a part of the community and it's just been lovely to collaborate on all of these projects with all of you lot um, and everybody else around the edges. I think that's a really lovely point to leave this um, event with uh, Jane's lovely kind words because really I mean I um, yeah when I talked about this event it was because we were doing lots of collaborative stuff and I was like this is really lovely and great and it'd be great if we could have these discussions in public so thank you everyone for tuning in I hope you've um, learned something more about Anne Lister and about Coldvale and Halifax and we hope when it's safe to do so that people 
will keep coming back and keep visiting us because it'd be great to have all these conversations in real life with people. But thank you, Sarah. Well.